just pray for you and for yeah. us. Thank you. Lord, we just thank you for our answer. We pray that you would put your word in his heart and, uh, and from there directly to us. Lord, would you bring us joy through his words as we get to know you uh, more closely. We thank you for him. Amen. Thank you, Nathalie. Everyone hearing me okay? Good. So, good morning. Our Lord Jesus said that there'll be a time when people won't worship in Judea, in Jerusalem anymore. And he also said that people won't worship in Samaria on Mount, I think it's Jerusalem, something like that. Cherism. But he said that there will be a time when people will worship in spirit and in truth. And this word truth means reality for real. So there's a time that people will worship God in spirit and in reality. And the Lord Jesus made that possible when he died on the cross. When God put all of our sin, your sin, my sin, on him. And then the Lord Jesus took the judgment that that sin deserved. The punishment for every failure, every mistake he took on him. And then when he exhausted that judgment... With his blood, he made a covenant with God, an agreement with God on our behalf. And we are the beneficiaries of this agreement. And we receive a personal relationship with God that he begins from his side. He will make himself known to us that we know him personally. He also puts his law the law of Christ in our minds and in our hearts. The law of Christ is that we love each other as Jesus loves us. And this is what he puts in our hearts and in our minds. And the Lord Jesus, with his blood, opened the way into God's presence and through his death for us so that we could come freely to God. So let's just pray for a moment and say Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you gave him for us, that you loved us so much. So, Father, we ask that you give us a spirit full of wisdom and revelation in the full knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we may really know him. Father, that we may know what he has done for us, what the finished work of the cross is, so that we can rest in that. And Father, we ask also that we may know the power of his resurrection that's working in us. And we thank you that you always hear us. Amen. So today I thought I'd like to have a look at the Samaritan woman that met Jesus at Jacob's well. And I guess... Most of you are familiar with this story. So can you tell me what kind, or remind me maybe, what kind of woman was she? One that gets thirsty in the middle of the day. Gets thirsty in the middle of the day? One who knows her, her, her scriptures. She knows the scriptures? She was an outcast. Why was she an outcast, Dave? Because she was a naughty girl. <laughs> she was a woman of, what, ill repute? Promiscuous? An adulteress? Is that the words? Why do you say that, Dave? Does it say that, or are we... Yeah, well, I'm just asking... So who taught us that? And where did we hear that she's an adulteress, that she's promiscuous? 
I don't know. Well, <laughs> let me then tell you first about my grandmothers. I had two, obviously. One had one husband. And that's on my mother's, I think my mother's side, yes. And on my father's side, my grandmother had two husbands. So let me tell you. When her first husband died, several years later, she met someone else. And she got married to him. So I gained a third grandfather, and she gained her second husband. So having more than one husband doesn't always mean it's due to divorce. Ah, we can, we'll get to that. So, um, Samaritans... Let's just talk about them for a moment. So, they were actually half-brothers of the Jewish peoples, or, or of, of the Jews. What happened about 200 years before this event, part of the northern tribes of Israel, the Ten, were carted off by the Assyrians. And then they replaced some of the people in that area with other nations. And these people then married the Jewish people, or that was left. And then when the people came back out of captivity and met these people again, they said, you aren't pure Israelites. And the hatred began there. They really didn't tolerate each other. Now, the Samaritans believed in the first five books of Moses that was written down. They celebrated Passover, but they worshipped on this Mount Gerasim. Now, let's have another look at another group of people who also believed in the first five books of Moses. And we read about them in Luke chapter 20, verse 27. And they were called the Sadducees. Now, they also believed in the written word, the first five books of Moses. They believed that there was no resurrection. And they came to Jesus with a question. Because they said, Moses wrote to us that if a man gets married to a wife, but he dies and they don't have any children, then she must be married to the next brother so that that brother could have children, basically for his brother. But this law was also designed to protect that widow because in this culture, if you didn't have a husband to look after you or you didn't have a family, children, that could look after you lately, you might be reduced to begging or something worse. And then they tell Jesus, and I think it's maybe about a real case, not a made-up case, of seven brothers. The oldest got married to a woman, then he died childless, and then they, she got married to a second one to have children, but then and he died childless, and then she got married to the third. And so on until the seventh, and he died childless, and then she died. Now, let's get back to the woman of Samaria. So the Lord Jesus says to her, you've had five husbands. So let me tell you about six brothers in Samaria. The one, the eldest, married a woman. They didn't have children, and he died. And then she was passed on or given to the second brother. They didn't manage to have children, but he died. And then she got given to the third brother. And he died without having any children. 
then she got given to the fourth brother. And he died as well. And I can sort of imagine the fifth and the sixth brother having a conversation like this. You know, the law says we must marry this woman. But we're going to die if we marry her. And the fifth brother went ahead and he married her because he wanted to keep the law. And he died. And then the sixth brother said, whoa, I am not going to marry you. I'll take you into my house so that you're not out in the streets. And you will look after you. But no marriage here. And it might be that he's been married already and the one wife might already be a bit of a handful. Sorry, might be enough for him. <laughs> so... Here you have a law that's supposed to protect this poor woman. But in the end, it's actually cruel to her because she becomes something like chattel or goods. She's just handed on from the one to the next. And then the one that should do the right thing for her doesn't want to anymore. So that's why she's not married to the sixth brother. So the law that should protect you and should help you is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't look at you as a person and take you into account. It just wants what is right. Her being passed on from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. But then God the God of the universe, who loves each of us so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to earth to come and show us how much he loves us. This God then works a desire into his son's heart to go from where he is in Judea at the Jordan to Galilee, but he had to travel through Samaria because God, the Father, had an appointment arranged between this Samaritan woman and his son, Jesus. And then the Lord Jesus met her at midday there at the well. And it's like the God, creator of the universe just puts everything on pause just to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, a one-on-one -on -one time with this poor woman. That's how much God loves her. And the fact that she comes at midday we can easily see the gossip that's built up. She must be maybe cursed because everyone she marries dies. And the person that's with her now is even too afraid to marry her. So that's one reason maybe why she avoided other people. But the fact, the other thing is she comes on her own. She comes to get some water at the well. Now, when I grew up, I thought my parents just had children to do the work they didn't want to do. They've later reassured me that's not truly the case. But to mow the lawn and do the dishes, I thought that's why they had me. If this woman had children, one of them would have gone to fetch the water, wouldn't they? Because that's why you have children. Get them to the job. Now, let me just get back to my other grandmother, the one who only had one husband. She had this habit of she'd be somewhere in a room, and the moment one of the grandchildren came in, she'd ask them to go and do something, like take the cup, go and wash it. 
and I walked circles around this grandmother. <laughs> Apparently, the other grandchildren say she wasn't like that, I've discovered recently. But the other thing I also noticed that when there's a family event, if her daughters-in-law were there, they'd be doing the work. She won't be doing things. So if this woman, the Samaritan woman, had children, grandchildren, or even if she was married and had daughters-in-law, they would have been the ones to fetch the water, not her. So she was childless. And this is the thing. God knew her circumstances. Because the Lord Jesus said to her, I know, I understand. You've been married five times. The fourth, or the, the, the last one that you know with, the sixth one, he doesn't want to marry you. He's not your husband. There's no one to love you, to cherish you, to be intimate with. But God wants you to have a future. He wants to give you a gift freely. Just ask me, he said, and I will give you water, the water of life. And once you drink of this water, it will spring up into, in your inner being, into a fountain of eternal life. And you'll never be thirsty again. This eternal life that Jesus offers and that he gives, it's eternal. It's constant. It's unlosable. Because he's the one that has done the work, that has made it possible for us to receive this gift of eternal life. And it all depends just on him. In fact, the invitation to come and have this eternal life is still open today. Because in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17, the writer says, Come, drink of the water. Let him who desire, or let the person who desires, desires it, come and get the water freely, without any price. And there's a gift that Jesus still offers us, that God the Father still offers you today. And then I think there's one last little bit to this uh, story of the Samar Samaritan woman. In the end, she goes to the other people of the, of the town or the city and says to them, come and have a look at this man. He told me everything. Is he the Messiah? And then I came and I invited Jesus in. And they got to know Jesus themselves. And they say to her, we don't believe anymore because of what you told us. We now believe because we have met Jesus and have heard him for ourselves. And it's a very important lesson, this bit, and I think it's for every one of us. Have you just heard about Jesus and is your faith dependent or resting on what other people have told you? But have you met this Jesus for yourself? Have you come to know him? Know him for yourself. That's the important bit. And this is what God offers you, a personal relationship with him. There was a time that I've heard about Jesus from other people. And then there came a moment when I met him. And I now know him for real. And if you want, I can introduce you to him. And I think we'll close there in prayer.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we could have a new look and new thoughts about someone that your son had an appointment with. And this is what you want for each of us, to have that moment, an appointment, to get to know your son for real, to have this eternal life so that we'll be never thirsty, that we'll be never alone, that we'll always just live in your love for us.